the question that I get a lot, and frankly, I can't answer, so I'm going to ask it to you. How do they work? How do, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, people call me up baffled, huh, uh, about how open baffle speakers work. And they say, you know, True. they just don't really believe it almost. They're like, you know, I, don't, I just, you know, I'm sitting there with them and I can tell them that, look, I hear them every day and they sound fantastic. Um, but, you know, how do you get that the sound, um, the, that full bass, you know, that, that airiness, why does it work? How does it work without getting okay. too technical? Sure. Uh, well, if you, if you look at the different types of speakers in closed box, open box, these kind of things, that it really is the simplest form that you could make a speaker. If you took a, a, a panel and you put a, a, a woofer on it, uh, that's what, what makes it open baffle is it's really the proper term is dipolar to where if you put a, a woofer onto this panel, there's a positive pressure wave coming off the front of it when it's in positive phase. So the, you get this, uh, effect where you're pressurizing air in the front of it and there's a, also at the same time a negative pressure field behind it so the back side of it is out of phase with the front side uh, that uh, can be good and bad there's some like in everything else in physics there's always trade-offs and that's really kind of maybe the key word in, in this whole discussion about boxes versus open baffle it's really managing the trade-offs and you, if you can minimize or eliminate the negatives then you have all positives left and that's really kind of what I think I've done here. Um, so the um, so what's really happening is super simple. In the, and that is that there's an interference effect on the edges of the panel on the sides and top and bottom to where the front and the back wave meet and they're out of phase with each other. So they just cancel out. There's just nothing. But that is only in the lower frequency part of the range. It has to be that's related to the baffle size and the woofer size, so wavelengths. So uh, short wavelengths are not involved in that, but long, you know, if you, you're talking about 10, 20, 30 foot wavelengths, um, they just simply wrap around the cabinet. So they, they, they meet together, they cancel out, and, and that's actually why designers don't, they don't like that. They want to, they say, well, we need to eliminate that problem. We'll put a box uh, on the back of it, and we're gonna isolate the, the front and the back so they don't cancel and you get a lot more bass that way. So it's more efficient, uh, but it doesn't, therein lies the rub. It's like, yeah, but what about the way it sounds and the way it loads the room? That's really the problem. Uh, so in other words, it's, it would be great to eliminate the box if you could get bass out of it and make it work. And so that's really what, that's my job. But the, the most commonly thought of uh, attribute of, of getting rid of the box is the fact that you don't hear the box sound. And that involves a number of things like cabinet vibration, uh, cavity effects, all kinds of different things are going on with the red, because the box is a resonant system, right? So um, you say, well, that'd be great to get rid of all that, but that's actually not the biggest problem. It is a, it is a noticeable audible, audible problem, but the, the biggest problem is the way it, it operates in a room. And this is really the, the overarching key to all this is that boxes don't ideally work very well or maybe even shouldn't be used in rooms that are the kind of size we see in houses. Okay, they're really too small. The boundaries are too close to the speaker. So in an auditorium, this is why pro audio works well with boxes and movie theater speaker design, which is where audio came from. When silent movies went to... Uh, soundtrack movies, that is audio. That's what we took it from. We were even buying movie derived, you know, uh, movie theater speakers, right? So in a, if in an auditorium, let's just say where the, it's a huge room, the box problems are the way it loads the room is not a problem because the, the boundaries are a long distance away from it. But you take that same speaker and you put it in a living room that's 12 feet wide, 15 feet long, uh, and immediately what happens is it, it creates a real problem because the base is radiating omnidirectionally. So there's energy coming out the sides and the top and bottom, as well as the lengthwise of the room, right? Mm -hmm. So the problem is in a home, those, that, those uh, perpendicular you know, height and width, those are the ones that are close to the speaker. So you're just dumping energy in, into resonant storage, you know, uh, room modes in, in the room. Uh, and that's what makes it sound muddy. Uh, and the closer you get to the boundary, the worse it gets. This is why you don't put 
speakers in a corn, right? Okay, so imagine then going back to the open baffle design where, okay, there's what we have now is more of a, since there's cancellation on around the periphery of it, we're, we're, we have the, what's left over as far as base, which is like figure eight effect. So there's a load coming out of the front, there's one coming out of the back, and there's nothing coming out of the sides or top. Okay, well, that's perfect because we now don't have energy going out into these, uh, these boundary resonance systems. Um, what we're left with is just the direct sound. This is a generalization. It's not quite that tidy, but, you know, but that's really what's happening is we've created a directional base system, and there really isn't any other practical way to do that uh, and eliminate all this room interaction stuff. Uh, so the smaller the room gets, the more this is an issue. And, and it comes up quite often. It's like, well, if my room is this small, like I took over my kid's bedroom when they moved out, went to college, the room is 10 by 12. Isn't that too small to put a open baffle speaker in? Because they're thinking, you know, they've always heard, hey, magna planers need large rooms. And it, it is very helpful to have a big open space. But as far as this room interaction problem goes, it's actually even more beneficial if the room is 10 or 12 feet uh, in 10 times 12 because uh, the because the box speaker is going to have that much more problem working in a room that's that small. And this is exactly why if you go back, I don't even remember, but I'm going to say the 70s when the BBC in, Eng in, in, um, in England, the whole idea there was don't even try to produce space. That's where all you know the mini monitor uh, stand mount thing came from and it works that's a very that's good advice because if you're in a small room which in europe rooms are generally quite small um you know that's a, that's probably the thing to do is just forget the deep base altogether and focus on the rest of it so you don't have all the problems and the droning and because that that boominess and droning and overlay kind of a effect of the room sound in the bass that affects the mid-range too so that's one thing that i think that's really interesting when you switch to open baffle that you, you go, is it just me or is the mid range? There's a lot more information. It's like you just unmask the whole thing. So um, there's, a, a, there's a lot of benefits to, to this approach. Uh, and some of it, you, you, don't, you wouldn't necessarily measure it or know how to measure it, but you can definitely hear it or perceive it, you know? Uh, so that's why I don't think the, your question about you know what kind of room uh, would be appropriate, really any kind of room, because of the advantages of the uh, the way it loads the room. Sure. So you know what I mean. So well, and.